Grace and peace to you from the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. The scholar, literary theorist and feminist critic Gayatri Spivak suggests that education is the non-coercive rearrangement of desire. Can we not also think of the Apostle Paul's writings as a form of education which aims at a rearrangement of desire? His writings are dialogic in nature and non-coercive in the sense of stimulating, honest, respectful, and at times uncomfortable discussions. They call for a deeper listening. Such listening is not about blowing one's own trumpet, but very much about the kind of hearing trumpet that the surrealist artist Leonora Carrington suggests. For it is not in speaking, but in listening, that we sense new possibilities for ourselves and others. The challenge is to listen deeply enough to co-create communities that recognize that they are in an ongoing state of becoming, which involves the continuous rearrangement of desire. Such rearrangement involves a continuous cycle of inquiry and action where we connect our learning to our lived experiences and pay attention to what arises. And there will always be blind spots that will be revealed when people begin to question dominant narratives and ways of seeing, hearing and being. Such rearrangement of desire includes being educated about the privileges and oppressions that people are subject to based on their age, class, cognitive and physical abilities, gender expression, nationality, race, religion, and sexuality. In his letter to the church in Corinth, Paul's rearrangement of desire culminates in the well-known song in praise of love in chapter 13. Paul's Song of Songs is meant to encourage faith communities to become safe spaces of encounter in which the dignity and equality of all people is affirmed and promoted, and it cannot be done without love. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of humans or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Paul's Song of Songs is introduced as the most excellent way, the way that surpasses all other ways, the foundation of every other gift, the one thing without which all our speaking is but a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, without love, our speaking will lack a proper tune. No matter how angelic our words, without love, they are but irritating noise. For a resounding gong, and a clanging cymbal by themselves produce no intelligible tune. And this is said to apply not only to our speaking, but to all the other gifts of the Spirit we might pride ourselves in. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul's words are hard-hitting and uncompromising. 
No matter how prophetic our insights on interpreting the signs of our times, and no matter how vast our knowledge and impressive our spiritual depth, without love all comes to nothing. No matter how strong our faith, able to overcome the biggest obstacles, without love all comes to nothing. No matter how giving and generous we are, willing even to make painful sacrifices without love, we will gain nothing. Yes, there might be a lot we are proud of, but without love we are nothing and will gain nothing. But what does such love then look like? Is Paul's Song of Songs speaking about human love? Is his intention to provide us with guidelines for how to relate to one another? There's a tendency to limit the song to romantic love between two people or the love of parents to their children or the love between friends. But given the first century context of his writings, romantic notions of love will have been alien to Paul. And he also didn't see himself as a family therapist or a couple counselor. Steeped into his own Jewish tradition, Paul did not think of love in individualistic terms, but primarily in relation to community or humanity as a whole. So we will have to ask again, what does such love look like concretely for Paul? In his Song of Songs, the word love is mentioned seven times. It is a word that goes straight to the heart and evokes all kinds of emotions, memories and desires. The English language uses one and the same word for different kinds of love. But the Greek language, in which Paul wrote and communicated, distinguished between mainly four kinds of love. Eros, philia, storge, agape. There's eros, which is passionate sexual desire. There's philia, which stands for the kind of warm affection found in friendship. Then there is storge, which refers to the protective love between family members. And finally, there is agape as the kind of love that is not based on feelings, but motivated primarily by the interest and welfare of others. Agape is also the word used to describe God's love. It is said to be unconditional and extending infinite empathy to everyone. In his Song of Songs, Paul speaks about agape love and uses the word seven times. When Paul speaks about agape love, he is describing a gift from God, fully revealed to us through Christ and poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Such love is more than a feeling or emotion. It nurtures the hopeful confidence that God is committed to liberate us from injustice and dominating structures that violate people's dignity and well-being. It inspires concrete action that aligns us with Christ's vision of peace. And such agape love also cannot really be separated into human and divine love. Both elements are rather intricately woven into each other. Paul's thinking was very much in line with the sentiments of the first letter of John, where it says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Human and divine love cannot be separated, for to live in love is to live in God. We therefore also cannot think of God's love in abstract terms. It is rather, it rather breathes and lives through human acts of love. It connects people with each other and with God. This is why Jesus considers loving God and the neighbor as oneself, as the summary of the whole Torah. Well, how are we to live such neighborly agape love as the most excellent way? Is this not asking too much of us? We might be relieved to know that in the Torah, such love of neighbor is not about emotions of affection, but rather about concrete actions centered around social justice. This is why Paul, just as Jesus, can summarize such neighborly love as the fulfillment of the law. Neighborly love is not about feelings, but about our concern for justice for the most vulnerable and marginalized in society. 
And it is through neighborly love that God's agape love becomes real and tangible, holding heaven and earth together. A separation of the two is impossible within the realm of agape love. Such love is a divine gift, the fulfillment of the Torah, and the very glue that binds people together in their pursuit of justice and equality for all. This is also why Paul evokes the metaphor of the body of Christ when speaking about being a faith community in the same letter to the Corinthians. The metaphor of the body is meant to be counter-cultural model, undermining the very hierarchies and power structures of the Roman Empire, which were about violently enforced division and oppression. Paul's vision of agape love suggests a very different model of life in community, where special attention and care is offered to those considered least in society. Leonora Carrington's The Q Symphony helps me to visualize Paul's Song of Songs. Her Q Symphony gives the child a prominent position and role. It is playing the lead harp to which a bird-like figure with clanging cymbals is attached. It perfectly resonates with Paul's warning that without the tune of love played on a harp by one of the least and most vulnerable members of society, we are but clanging cymbals. A choir of dog-like creatures seems to howl along full of admiration and devotion. I only wish the clerical figure in the center would rather be playing a hearing trumpet. He's joining in with too much confidence and gusto. I will speak more about the church's problematic role in interpreting Paul's Song of Songs in the second part of my reflections. Yes, what if this man of the cloth is not even playing to the same tune of love as a child on the harp? Did the institution of the church not all too often align itself with those in power, singing and playing to the tune of those protecting the unjust status quo? Maybe the Q symphony stands for a symphony in Q minor. What if this holy man is in fact blasting completely out of tune? There must be a reason that he's surrounded by three rather ominous-looking musicians on the guitar, trumpet and organ. They add a sinister mood to the painting. What if this scene is in fact portraying a clash of two very different tunes? And did Paul's Song of Songs not also play a very different tune from the one the colonized and oppressed had to bear throughout the Roman Empire? Paul's agape love undermined Rome's elitist and divisive goal of a peace through brutal violence. It exposed Rome's imperial tune for what it was, a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. We have seen how Paul begins with love being indispensable and the foundation of our speaking, believing and acting. It is the way above all ways and the basis for all other gifts of the Spirit. What are then the main points Paul is making about an agape love which is concerned about issues of justice, inequality, dignity and freedom? Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, 
It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love is a dynamic event, a doing and becoming, not simply a being. It is something that can hardly be pinned down, but has to be encircled. This is why Paul speaks less about what love is and more about what love is not. And this explains why he then continues to speak about how all our knowing is always fragmented and partial. The full revelation of love is still to come. But listening to love and learning about love always occurs in a concrete context and cannot be isolated from the conditions that affect our lives. When one looks at the way this passage has been interpreted over the many centuries as a kind of advice and instruction for intimate relationships, one would have to also acknowledge that within a patriarchal context, Paul's joyful vision of love has been distorted. Paul's definition of love has been and continues to be used and abused to dominate women and reinforce a particular gender stereotype. Paul expected the whole congregation to live and embody such love. But from early on, the church's teachings were such that mainly women were asked to identify with such agape love. So if we replace the word love with women, we will get a better idea of how Paul's Song of Songs is usually misunderstood within a patriarchal society. Women are patient and kind. They do not envy, they do not boast, they are not proud, they do not dishonor others, they are not self-seeking, they are not easily angered, they keep no record of wrongs. Women do not delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. They always protect, always trust, always hope, always persevere. And the same could be said for the way children were expected to submit and behave. They had no rights. And since they were said to have been born with what was considered a biologically transmitted original sin, adults had the obligation to discipline their children, if necessary, use corporal punishment to help them become proper adults. I don't think I need to go into more details to illustrate how Paul's praise of love has been distorted to become an instrument of patriarchal subjugation to silence women and children and cover up the abuse and violence suffered at the hands of those who assumed God-like authority and power over them. Given the history of this patriarchal capture of Paul's Song of Songs, I'm not surprised that the theologian Torsten Lutzel titled his interpretation of 1 Corinthians with, This is not a love song. His contribution forms part of a book that attempts to address the recent discoveries of sexualized violence also within the Lutheran Church in Germany. It is a major earthquake. Perpetrators of sexual violence were protected by the institution and survivors were silenced. Congregants looked away out of respect for their superiors. What could not be true was not to be true. Children and young people were not protected. Such cover-up was based on an idealized self-image of the church and reinforced by established power structures. In the name of love and the ideal of a family culture of harmony, endless cases of sexualized violence were simply ignored and covered up. The message of God's love and the love of neighbor have been distorted and turned on its head. Those affected have not only suffered bodily violations, their soul has also been injured, they have been robbed of sexual self-determination, and they've lost their ability to trust another person. How do those survivors make sense of Paul's songs of songs? Did Jesus not say in John's Gospel that only the truth is able to set us free? And did Paul not also emphasize that love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. But what does such truth and freedom look like? It has to also involve a critical look at the kind of church structures and teachings that allow for such violation and terrible abuse of trust in a space that is meant to be safe and nurturing. 
Indeed, it was naive and irresponsible to assume that such sexual violence, sexualized violence, only happens out there. How then can we learn to speak about love in a way that does not teach silent submission but bold resistance against any form of abuse of power? How can we prevent that Paul's praise of love is confused with silent submission? I'm asking this question specifically in the present context of Child Protection Week and the renewed focus on safeguarding the well-being of the children entrusted to our love and care. If education involves the rearrangement of our desire to safeguard the most vulnerable, have we not been too glib and comfortable in affirming a divine love that is always patient and kind, long-suffering and enduring? To what extent does our desire for harmony blind us to the reality of sexualized violence and prevents us from naming and addressing guilt clearly and concretely? To what extent does our understanding of love move us too quickly to speak about the need for forgiveness and reconciliation? Is God's love not also impatient, demanding, taking sides with the vulnerable and wounded, seeking truth and longing for justice? We would do more justice to Paul's exploration of love if we stop confusing love with our usual rhetoric of harmony and keeping the peace. Context matters, and depending on when and how this praise of love is read, certain aspects must speak louder and more forcefully. What does it mean that love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres in the context of sexual abuse and violence? Too often survivors have been burdened and victimized a second time with the expectation to silently suffer and forgive their perpetrators. Such cheap and cruel grace has nothing to do with the kind of love Paul talks about. To the contrary, genuine love seeks truth, no matter how hard and painful, and does not cover up evil. Those injured and wounded have a right to be heard. They should never be silenced, and perpetrators should not be protected, but have to be held accountable for their transgressions in the legal courts. No, this is not a love song. If we think of love as a quick fix to restore harmony and peace at the expense of the survivors, does Paul not also speak about mature responsibility and accountability when he argues when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put the ways of childhood behind me. What is Paul saying here about the relation between love and accountability when boundaries are transgressed? Children and young people cannot always comprehend what is happening to them, what love is and is not, and where abuse and sexualized violence begins. This is why they need to be protected, for those affected cannot simply leave behind what happened to them in their childhood when they become adults. Often the pain is too heavy to bear, and the only way to survive is to bottle up the pain deep within one's soul. And truth, not time, is supposed to help heal the wounds. Paul is very clear. What love does not, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. In other words, love does not injure the boundaries of someone's body and soul. Love does not abuse power. Love does not pretend to be blind where injustice is done. To read those verses from the perspective of the survivors is an important corrective because love and God belong to the most abused words in our vocabulary and have also been used in order to cover up injustice. So if this song of song is not a love song, what is it then? Maybe we should be open to reread it as a critical checklist to prevent us from confusing love with cheap grace. It will remind us to identify clear boundaries and to see more clearly the reality of the abuse and sexualized violence also within the institution of the church. 
Such sexual abuse often goes hand in hand with spiritual abuse, which uses the rhetoric of love and God to silence. And if you still want to think of it as a love song, then rather call it a song of resistant love, a song in praise of justice, freedom and love, very much along Peter, Paul and Mary's hammer of justice, bell of freedom and song about love. It is about hammering out love by hammering out danger and warning all over this land. It is about ringing out love by ringing out danger and warning all over this land. It is about singing out love by singing out danger and warning all over this land. Only then is Paul's song in praise of resistant love truly worthy of being called the song of songs. And so, as you leave from here, God bless you with the hammer of justice, the bell of freedom, and a song about resistant love. Amen. It's a hammer of justice.